Uh, morning everybody, good to see you and uh, thank you for your prayers for Gillian and I while we were away. Um, we really appreciated that. We were going to give a, a report back this morning but it seemed that it was more important to do the report back on the holiday club so we'll say more about our trip next Sunday morning. But it was a good time and we needed your prayers, so thank you for praying for us. Keep your Bibles open and also the outline in the white bulletin. Please have that open in front of you. And uh, let's ask for God's help as we come to the first study in our series, The God Who Answers Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is our joy to worship you together and bring you the adoration of our hearts and the consecration of our lives. We thank you that you are our Father, that you know us through and through, and that your word is able first to find us, then speak to us, then transform us. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, this passage will come alive to our hearts and minds this morning. And so we say, Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Joan Byers is uh, an American singer and uh, songwriter and political activist. And uh, during the Vietnam War, she travelled to Hanoi with a, poli- uh, with a peace delegation. And she was there during an extended American bombing campaign that lasted for 12 days. This is how she described her experience. She said, quote, We spent the whole time in the basement of the hotel. I've never been so afraid in my life. I thought I was going to die. But I learned something. When the flames start coming towards you, everyone starts praying, even the atheists and the agnostics. But when the flames start fading away, we all go back to the structures and beliefs we had before. End quote. Now that's right, isn't it? There is something in every human being that instinctively turns to prayer in a crisis. Now they might not be religious, but when a storm hits, people pray. When the storm has passed, they stop. Now the great question is, are we Christians any different? Uh, Jesus demonstrated the importance of prayer by his own example. His entire ministry was saturated in prayer. And he taught his disciples how to pray because he expects us to do it. But do we? Do we honestly have a healthy prayer life? It's a sad fact that the prayer meeting is usually the most poorly attended event in the church calendar. And uh, that fact alone should cause us to want to examine our own hearts. Now there are many different reasons why Christians don't pray as we ought. One of them is we think we're not terribly good at it and we don't really want to trouble God with our rather feeble efforts. Uh, We might be very comfortable reading our Bibles, coming to church on Sunday, but when it comes to private prayer, many people feel rather at sea and very unsure whether something worthwhile is actually happening. But against that, the Bible insists that prayer is a privilege that God gives to all his children. It means that we can approach him at any time with all of life's challenges and be absolutely certain that God is listening. What an amazing gift! What a pity we make such poor use of it. Now in this little series of five studies we want to get to the heart of prayer. Why pray? What motivates prayer? Are there particular prayers that God is especially pleased to answer? How are we to understand unanswered prayer? These are some of the questions that we're going to be trying to answer together. 
And our method is going to be to explore the subject of prayer through the eyes of perhaps the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, But before we come to our passage this morning, just one word of caution. We are not Elijah. We're not meant to come away from this chapter today expecting ravens to arrive on our doorstep tomorrow morning with food parcels. It's true that in the New Testament, uh, the book of James describes Elijah as a man like us. Well, that's true. But Elijah had a unique role in the Bible which you and I don't share. So instead, when we come to a passage like this, our eyes are meant to be fixed on God. And the question that we're meant to keep asking is this. What is God doing and what does it teach me about his unchanging way of dealing with all his children in every generation? Well, Elijah's experience of God in this chapter presents us with three questions where our own prayer lives are concerned. Here they are. Number one, do you know God's word? Number two, Do you obey God's word? Number three, do you trust God's word? Those questions have a crucial bearing on the effectiveness of our prayer lives. So number one, do you know God's word? Now as our passage begins in 1 Kings 17, uh, we're in the year 870 B.C., Uh, It's about 60 years after the kingdom of Israel has been divided in two. And we find ourselves this morning in the northern kingdom. And on the surface, things are pretty good. Uh, A man called Ahab is on the throne, and his reign lasts for 22 years. So there is political stability and peace in the land. On top of that the country is enjoying something of an economic boom. Uh, That's because Ahab married a woman called Jezebel and uh, that marriage has given Israel access to international markets through the ports controlled by Jezebel's father in the north. But if things look good on the outside, spiritually, on the inside... Israel is in freefall. Uh, Jezebel has brought with her the religion of her own country, which is the worship of Baal. Uh, Baal was the god of fertility, uh, the god of fields and flocks, and uh, because on top of that he was also the god of rain, he was worshipped as the giver of life. Uh, Baal worship was in many respects very similar to the prosperity gospel today. And so anxious to please his new wife and his father-in-law, Ahab has embraced this new religion. So if you glance back with me for a moment to chapter 16 and verse 32, can we all see chapter 16 and verse 32 in our Bibles? Uh, You can see that the author of 1 Kings gives us an assessment of Ahab's reign from God's point of view. 1 Kings 16.32 Ahab set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, that's a kind of shrine. Now notice this. And did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. Now you see, that is the background against which Elijah bursts onto the scene in chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, We're told absolutely nothing about him except where he came from. But in scripture, names are nearly always significant. And Elijah's name means... The Lord is my God. So while everybody else has forgotten about the Lord and his word, here at least is one man 
who is unafraid to stand against the tide. And he arrives at Ahab's palace with a devastating announcement. 17 verse 1 As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now we know from uh, the letter of James in the New Testament that that was precisely what Elijah had prayed for. James tells us, James 5.17, you don't need to turn to it, Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Now the question is, why did Elijah pray that particular prayer? Was he simply being malicious and spiteful? Did he even pause to consider the human suffering that a terrible drought would cause? Why did he do it? Well, the answer is quite extraordinary. Uh, Keep one finger, please, in 1 Kings 17 and turn back with me to Deuteronomy 11 on page 138. Deuteronomy chapter 11, page 138. And I'm going to pick it up at verse 16. Now these are the instructions which Almighty God gave to Israel before they entered the promised land. Verse 16. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you. And notice this. He will shut the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Why should they do that? Verse 20. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your forefathers, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. Now what I want you to notice is that Elijah prayed that God would do what he said he would do. Not with malice, but so that Israel would be reminded that God is always true to his word. So that Israel might repent before it was too late. Now friends, that tells us something absolutely fundamental about the purpose of prayer. In prayer, God invites us to ask him to do what he's already declared to be his will. Now, to help you get a hold of that, uh, on the reverse of the blue question sheet, uh, I've given you a quotation from one of the better books on prayer published in recent years by Graham Goldsworthy. And he says this, It is sometimes said that prayer is thinking God's thoughts after him. This is a useful way of expressing the fact that authentic prayer seeks conformity to the gospel. It comes down to this. Having revealed his purpose, God graciously allows us as his dear children to be involved in carrying out his will. He gives us the privilege of identifying with his will by asking him to do what he has already determined to do. God loves us to ask for the things he's revealed he wants to give us. And this is part of the process he's chosen to use in order to carry out his plan for the whole universe. I want you to think about that with me for a moment. Because if God has made human beings to rule over the world that he has made under his authority and Genesis chapter 1 tells us God has done precisely that how do Christians today begin to discharge their responsibility? Answer, by praying 
according to God's word. But of course, in order to do that, we need to know God's word, don't we? We need to know what God has said. And so the first challenge that Elijah puts before us in 1 Kings 17 is, do you know God's word? Because if you don't, you can't pray as God intends us to. We'll come back to 1 Kings 17, page 255, and let's look at the second challenge in our passage this morning, which is, do you obey God's word? You see, it's one thing, isn't it, to know what's in the Bible intellectually, to be able to pass an exam, for example. I mean, we can say that we know Jesus summarised the entire law as love for God and love for neighbour. We can know that as a, as a matter of record. But friends, when the Bible talks about knowing the truth, it's asking something way deeper than that. It's asking the question, are you living it out? Do you actually know it to be true in your own experience? So, in uh, John's Gospel, uh, we find in one place that Jesus is talking to people who say they believe in him. They know the basics. And yet Jesus has to say to them, if you hold to my teaching, in other words, if you obey it, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now what's Jesus saying there? He's saying that we can only really know the truth in the way the Bible means that if we obey it. If we're going to pray with any real spiritual power, we must know God's word to be true, not merely theoretically, not merely on paper, but in our own lives. And Jesus says the only way we can get to that point is by obedience. So in our passage, 1 Kings 17, what we find, it's really interesting this, we find God building Elijah's faith, not in a classroom, but in three tests which are designed to help him discover the reliability of God's word in the particular calling that God has given to him. The three tests follow the same pattern and each test has the same three elements. First of all, there is a word from the Lord. Secondly, there is a human response of faith and obedience. And then thirdly, there is God's fulfilment. So follow this through me, uh, follow this through with me in the first of these tests, picking it up at verse 2. Chapter 17, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastwards and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. Now pause on that. Notice the command comes with a promise. God says, Elijah, you go and hide, there's the command, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. That's a promise. Now that is always the pattern in scripture. God's commands always come with a promise. But here, in each of these tests, the promise has got a supernatural ingredient that is quite beyond normal human experience. We can think of it as a sort of stretching ingredient that is designed to stretch and build Elijah's faith in God's word. So set aside for a moment how we might feel about receiving our daily rations from ravens and notice how Elijah responds in verse 5. Verse 5. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. 
he went to the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. Now, Elijah might have had all kinds of questions in his mind about the diet, but he obeys. And throughout the Bible, that is the mark of authentic faith. If I have real faith, I believe the promise and I show that I believe the promise by obeying the command. Those two things always go together. So when the Lord Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel, how do I show that I believe the gospel? By repenting. By giving up the old life with me in the middle, Simon Clegg number one, not that anymore, and making Jesus first in my life. And for Elijah, as Elijah obeys God's word, notice this, he experiences the miraculous provision of God. Verse 6. Verse 6. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Well, of course. Because if God says he's going to do something, he does it. But it was through obedience that Elijah came to know the truthfulness of God's word at a much deeper level than he knew it before. And his faith is strengthened. Now, my dear friend, can I ask you, has that been your experience? Has your obedience brought you to a point where you really value and treasure God's word? Because if it has, the very first place it's going to show up is in your prayer life. Because you will pray confidently, you will pray expectantly, knowing that as you pray according to God's word, he will delight to answer you. But your obedience must come first. Do you obey God's word? Thirdly, lastly, do you trust God's word? Now when the the brook uh, dries up, there is a a second faith-building experience as the word of the Lord comes to Elijah in verse 9. God says, go to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Well, once again, Elijah obeys. And verse 10, when Elijah came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. So, can you see, once again, through obedience, Elijah discovers that God's word holds up. But now there's a problem. Because when uh, Elijah asks this woman for food, she's got virtually nothing. All she has left is uh, a handful of flour in a jar and a tiny bit of oil in a jug. Nothing else. So, at this point... She barely has enough for one small final meal for herself and her son and and then death. So this widow is hopeless and helpless at this point. But this time, into her hopelessness comes the command from God's prophet. Verse 13, God's prophet bringing God's word, don't be afraid, Go home, do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. And with the command comes the promise. Notice this. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up And the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Now it's very easy for you and I to miss the enormity of Elijah's command here. Because you see, he's not asking her, is he? 
to give up a tiny fraction of her weekly shopping basket. It's not that. He's asking her to put everything that she has on the line on the basis of God's promise. Well, amazingly, verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah told her. She obeyed. Now, what was the result? So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Please notice the daily drama of the miracle. See, it wasn't the sudden arrival of a humanitarian aid truck driven by Bob Geldorf with 50 sacks of grain and enough oil to last for several years. It wasn't that, was it? I mean, that would have been pretty impressive. The newspapers would have been full of it. Instead, it was a small miracle. Every day, for three years, until the rains came. Now think about that. By trusting everything that she had into God's care, she discovered that she could trust God to meet her daily needs. Every morning she would go into the kitchen to make breakfast, and every morning she would discover that God had kept his promise. Now friends, that is an absolutely beautiful picture of the way that God is still working today. God says to you and me this morning, if you will trust me with everything you have, I will give you everything you need. Not everything you want. I will give you everything you need. But there is a flip side to the coin. There's a serious warning in this passage. Most of the commentators uh, see Elijah's travel itinerary as God's way of preserving Elijah through the drought and protecting him from Ahab. And that is partially true. There is some truth in that. But it misses the main point. Remember, will you, that Elijah's job is to be the bearer of the word of the Lord. That is a prophet's job description. He represents the word of God. So when God commands Elijah to go to Zarephath, God was actually taking his word away from Israel because Zarephath was outside Israel. Israel had long ago given up trusting God's word, so in the end, God's judgment came in two forms. Number one, the drought, but the much more severe judgment was the silence of God in the land. Now, that also is how God deals with his people in every generation. When they despise his word, he simply takes it away. One final cross-reference will drive the point home. Turn to Luke 4 on page 725. Luke chapter 4, verse 22, page 725. While you're turning there, let me tell you the context here is that the Lord Jesus has just finished preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth, Luke 4, verse 22. And Luke tells us what went on. All spoke well of Jesus, verse 22, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. 
I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman and the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove Jesus out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now why were the religious people in the synagogue so terribly upset with Jesus? Well, because he was saying that when God sent Elijah to the widow in Zarephath, he was removing his word from those who despised it and giving it to someone else. And he was saying to them, when they rejected him, when they rejected Jesus, he would do the same thing. Now there may be somebody here this morning saying, well that can't possibly happen to us. Um, I mean, after all, we've got access to more Christian literature than any generation in history. Uh, I'm told that there are 58 different types of study Bible on the market today. Isn't that remarkable? 58 different kinds. And of course, uh, endless Christian resources on the internet, marvellous large evangelistic conventions and rallies. You might be very active in all of that. But if you despise God's word by not trusting God's promises and by disobeying his commands, you might find that whilst you actually have the Bible in your hand, that the word of God has left you. And you might not even have realised it's happened. You can pray as much as you like. God won't be listening. Come back to 1 Kings 17. One final knot that we need to untie. 1 Kings 17, verse 17. Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. So, after the amazing provision of the endless flour and the endless oil, there's this devastation. And it seems as if God, who's been so busy proving his faithfulness in the chapter, is incredibly inconsistent. So, what are we to make of it? Well, remember the context. The nation of Israel has turned away from God and is spiritually dead. Now, if you're a thoughtful Bible reader, you will remember that God had made a fundamental promise earlier in the Old Testament to bring blessing to the whole world through Israel. So can you see the stakes here are incredibly high? Because no Israel, no salvation, no gospel in Africa. And God has commissioned Elijah, just one prophet, to bring the entire nation to repentance. So faced with such an impossible task, what is the one thing that Elijah needs to know? Well, he needs to know that God's going to keep his promise, doesn't he? And so once again he prays that God will keep his promise to the widow and her son to preserve their lives. Verse 21. Elijah stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, 
Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. You see, friends, this pagan widow learned what actually all of us need to learn, which is that in the end, the only thing that you and I can rely on is God's word of promise. But in the end, that is actually all we need. Because by answering Elijah's prayer, the Lord shows that he gives life to those who trust his word. He gives life, he sustains life, he restores life. But only, only to those who trust his word. That is the most important thing that any human being needs to know. And therefore the vital question for you and I to take away this morning into our lives this week is, do I trust God's word? I sincerely hope you do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer and know that you hear us because of Jesus. Lord, please help us to trust your word, to embrace the promises you've given us in the gospel and to plead these promises before you for ourselves, for our loved ones and for the lost. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.